No one, no person can give you assurance. Your friend can't give you assurance. Your parents, your siblings, not even my pastor. Yeah. You can't give me assurance. Yeah. Assurance comes from God. Welcome to the Sound Words Podcast, where our goal is to help Christians love and live out God's word. I'm Jesse Randolph. I'm one of the hosts of the podcast. I'm here with Pastor Aaron Nicholson, another pastor at Indian Hills and the co-host of the podcast. And we're continuing on in our series on assurance, assurance of salvation for the Christian believer. And we did episode one. That was our last episode where we looked at, can we have assurance? And now I get to sit in this chair and ask you the questions, Aaron, and ask questions about the enemies of assurance. Right. You ready? I'm ready. First, it feels very weird to hear you doing the intro when I'm just sitting right next to you. And keep listening, listeners, because we have a surprise. No No surprise. (laughs) Aaron is going to close out the episode by doing the 2 Timothy 1.13 reading. It's very exciting. So stay tuned. Question number one, is it wrong for a believer to experience doubt about their salvation? Okay, good question. So a believer, someone who believes in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection as payment for their sins. No, I don't think it's a wrong or a sin for a believer necessarily to doubt their salvation. Um, actually, we were just talking a few months ago, we did a, a podcast with Dr. Tim Miller, and he was very helpful in answering this question. Um, the, the title of that episode is, Is Doubt a Sin? And so listeners, be sure to go check that out. But I like what he said. He said, sometimes doubt is evidence of a thinking Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's true. I think it can be like pain for the human body. You know, if you're bleeding internally and and you can't see it uh, without pain, you wouldn't know what's wrong. You wouldn't know that you possibly need surgery or that your, your life's in jeopardy, but that pain tells you that something's wrong. Right. Um, So I think doubt can be a symptom that causes you to want to diagnose your heart and see what might be wrong, see what you need to change. Mm. Also in that episode, Dr. Miller brought up three types of doubt in the Bible, and different pastors and and theologians have termed these differently, but I liked his terminology, and so I'll I'll use it here. But the three types of doubt in the Bible are, number one, intellectual doubt. Uh, It's when you're presented with facts that contradict what you already know to be true. I think of a Jehovah's Witness, you know, ringing your doorbell and saying, Jesus is not God. And maybe that, you know, takes you back a little bit. Maybe you haven't fully developed that doctrine in your mind. You haven't studied it. Mm -hmm. And so for the believer, what does that cause them to do? It causes them to go back to the word and go to passages like John 1 or Colossians 1 and and say, okay, well, he's before all things and in him, all things hold together. Jesus is God. And that takes care of that intellectual doubt. Number two, there could be emotional doubt. Um, Say you have a loved one pass away or a family member is diagnosed with an incurable disease. That may bring up questions like, where are you, God? How could you allow this to happen to me? Um, I think even in the Psalms, David experienced this kind of emotional doubt. In Psalm 13, he writes, How long, O Yahweh, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Um, David was a man after God's own heart, and yet he felt like God left him to his own resources, like he had to handle his own questions himself. He could have wallowed in that state, but no, he didn't. He did the right thing. He did what 1 Peter 5 talks about, cast your anxieties on him. He cares for you. At the end of that psalm, he writes in verse 5, but I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully with me. So there's there's a case of emotional doubt and David did the right thing as a believer going to the Lord with it. I was also thinking about a, uh, a lunch I had with somebody recently where he told me that his son passed away suddenly and tragically and he was struggling with, you know, just these emotional doubt type questions. He did say, you know, he felt like his heart had to catch up to where his mind is, mm. something to that effect. In other words, he he had to make sure that his spiritually led mind, spiritually saturated mind, led his emotionally saturated heart. Yeah. Um, so I thought a good example of of emotional doubt. And then there's the third kind of doubt, volitional doubt or doubt of the will. 
Um, this describes the skeptic, the person who uh, claims to have an open mind, but in reality wants nothing to do with God's word. And they've already decided not to believe God and their questions and comments reflect that. And even their lives reflect it. Um, the person who is willfully doubting God has no desire to read their Bible with any consistency, no desire to pray, no desire to be around other believers, to live a holy life. Um, their lives just reflect that they have walked away from Christ. And even in the Gospels, we see this happen. Just think of all the people who walked away from Christ. Um, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Herod, Pilate, the rich young ruler, they all asked questions to Jesus. They heard his answers and, and it wasn't enough for them. They walked away. Um, in that rich young ruler example in Matthew 19, he asked Jesus about eternal life and obeying the law. And, and what did Jesus essentially tell him that well, if you want to follow me, you have to love me more than your possessions. Yep. You have to love me more than your money. And he went away grieving because he owned much property. Um, so he demonstrated volitional doubt. He wasn't willing to accept the truth that Jesus was presenting him. Instead, he was loving the world. So no, it's not necessarily wrong for a believer to experience doubt, um, especially the intellectual and emotional kind we see in scripture from believers. But I think it's the volitional doubt that um, is the dangerous one. That's the one that... Um, needs to be repented of. Yeah, that, that's very helpful to have you again have us hear that 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 division of these different types of doubt that exist that are recorded in Scripture even. Mm -hmm. And it's helpful, I think, even to think about that the Scriptures record these incidences of other people doubting. And maybe that's not in every case an instance of of God approving doubt, but it's certainly part of the human experience right? as, as those who are made in, in God's image. And we were talking about this even earlier, that even those three categories reflect what it means to be made in God's image, mm -hmm. to have intellect, to have emotion, to have will. So it's interesting now that the, the three types of doubt you're describing follow that same pattern of what it means to be made in the image of God. Right. So, and even on the emotion, the emotional type of doubt that you referenced, that Psalm 13 passage at the very end, you quoted it he gets back to remembering God's loving kindness. Yeah. So the example you just gave of the gentleman that you had lunch with, they're, they're, you have to sift even the emotions down through the lens of what do you remember about the character of God? Mm -hmm. And God has always been faithful. God has never departed, never will leave or forsake. Um, he's always there. He's always good and, and sovereign. And, and even David there in Psalm 13 yeah. gets back, he eventually takes those emotional roller coaster he's on as he's being chased down and takes it back to God's loving kind of, loving kindness sovereign hand, his protection. Yeah. And it's neat so, that he does that for us. Right. I mean, he, he charts it out in Psalm 13. He could have just ended it at verse four right. and we'd be like, man, that guy's depressed. Yeah. But he he finished it by going to the Lord's loving kindness and his faithful love. And and man, that is characteristic of what we need to do yep. when we struggle with that that type of doubt. All three kinds of doubt, yep. even if it's, you know, volitional doubt with repent, go, go to the word. What does the word say? Yep. And, and that's a perfect segue to the next question. How, how can scripture whether it's Psalm 13 or elsewhere, help us navigate those, those seasons of doubt or, there's, or those instances of doubt. Yeah. You mentioned this in the last episode about James 1 and the mirror. Scripture can help us work through doubt because it acts like a mirror in our lives. You know, when we wake up in the morning, we look in the mirror and we, we look to see if there's anything we need to change. For me, it's a question of to shave or not to shave. <laughs> that is the question, right? But Christians need to look into the mirror of God's word to see what they need to change and to see where they need to conform to be more like God. James 1, 23 through 25 says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgot what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an, a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in what he does." So I think if you're having doubts about Christ, about salvation, what happens um, after I die, mm -hmm. um, how do I know if I'm saved? Got to go to the source. Yep. Got to go to God's word, see what he says, see his evaluation. And I know you recently taught James 1, and so feel free to add more uh, exegesis to, to what I'm saying here. But um, holding up God's word to our lives shows reality. Yeah. Yeah. Truth. Truth comes out. I mean, that's yeah. that's what we need. We're... We're people of the book. We're people of truth. There's a world that's out there telling us all kinds of lies about who we are or who we ought mm. to be. And 
Yeah, taking it back to the mirror yeah. is, uh, is essential. Too often we use the wrong mirror, right? A lot of right. people use like social media for the mirror. What are other people doing? Right. And, and that's what I need to be doing. Yeah, and, and by the way, the answer to whether you should shave is ask your wife. <laughs> that's that's the answer. What if she's vague about it? Well, she's like, I don't care. Well, you both go to the word, you pray, you there seek you the Lord, and then yeah. you, you find a solution. Find all that. <laughs> find Aaron had a beard. There we go. Yeah, that's true. Oil dripping down the beard of Aaron. I'm pretty sure that's not the application. Oh, but anyway, it's not? Okay. Yeah. All right. Next question. Well, what are the what are the primary enemies of assurance uh, for the believer, and what specific factors will lead individuals to question their salvation? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, the first and most obvious enemy, I think, is false salvation. Hmm. That's the enemy of assurance. Some people don't feel saved because they're not. Mm-hmm. They they believe in a false gospel. Maybe they've never actually read their Bibles. Maybe they've only believed what you know the false teachers on TV have said, mm-hmm. um, or maybe they do assent to the facts of the Bible, but they don't practice them. They don't. They have not submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Um, that was my uh, life before salvation mm-hmm. as well. Just claiming Christ, but not actually living for Him. Um, This person goes to church, they maybe sing, they they give their money, but then they go to work and they live exactly like the world. Or when they're alone and no one's watching, their their true desires come out. Their sinful nature rises to the surface. So false belief is an enemy of assurance. That's why 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed fail the test? For number two, Um, A second enemy of assurance is false obedience. In other words, sin. False obedience is sin. Mm -hmm. The believer believes what Jesus did for them. They've maybe submitted their life to Christ. They've seen a pattern of growth, but they still struggle with sin. Now, like James 3 says, we all stumble in many ways. Scripture is clear about that. Believers do sin. But any amount of sin, and especially habitual sin, can cause us to doubt our salvation. It can cause us to doubt the truth of God's word. Mm -hmm. Um, The believer knows that Galatians 5 talks about the deeds of the flesh, immorality, impurity, sensuality, greed, outbursts of anger. And they know that verse 21 says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if a believer is persistently sinning, then there there is a good reason to doubt your salvation. Uh, Habitual sin is an enemy of assurance. So if you're calling yourself a Christian, but you're addicted to pornography, you can't have assurance. If you're calling yourself a Christian, uh, but you're enslaved to drunkenness, you can't have assurance. If you're calling yourself a Christian, but your your thoughts and your speech are, don't reflect Christ in, in a habitual way, you can't call yourself a Christian. That's why our task is to be radical about killing sin in our lives. Sin is the disease that keeps us uh, from a healthy Christian life. Yeah. Yeah. And I've often heard the question, you know, that what is practical, what's a practical difference between, you know, an instance of sin and being given over to the sin? And maybe that leads into our next question. You know, if, if someone continually battles the same sin, does that indicate they're not saved? And, and I guess I want to ask it, you know, this way, some will say, well, if I just do it once, hmm. does that mean I'm not a Christian, whatever the sin is versus if I do it 10 times, does that mean I'm not a Christian? So uh, maybe let's like lean into a little bit of the discussion on on the nature of that question that gets asked. How much is too much mm-hmm. to mean I'm not now assured of salvation? Um, maybe we can even go into, is that the right question to be asking? Right. What are your thoughts? Yeah, there's no number given yeah. in scripture. I mean, scripture doesn't say you commit that sin three times, you're, right. you're done. In fact, thinking of the examples in scripture, I thought of uh, Peter. You know, Peter denied Jesus three times, even when Jesus told him, you're, you're going to deny me. He's like, no, I'll never deny you. Uh, first, he denied Jesus to a servant girl. Then he denied Jesus to a man, then another man. And that third man, it says he began to curse and swear and say, you know, I, I swear by God that I do not know this man is essentially what he said. Was he an unbeliever because he committed the same sin three times in a row? No, I don't think so. Um, other scriptures point to to men who have um, sinned multiple times or at least lived in unrepentant sin. I think of King David after he murdered and committed adultery. He had this period of unrepentant sin in his life. Or the Corinthians who who were immoral persistently. This fits with what we know about the atonement. You know, if Christ died for our sins, uh, then that includes the sins we've repeated. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not as if Christ says, well, I'll forgive you for the first time you lied, but not for the second 
Colossians 2.13 says, he made you alive with him, having graciously forgiven us all our transgressions. However, on the other hand, sin does not belong in the life of a believer. Yeah. Habitual sin is is confusing. Um, it doesn't make sense. Right. Romans 6 says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Yeah. At, at, at minimum, it's confusing. Yeah. That that one who would claim the name of Christ would, would be engaged habitually in sin. Um, it would also be confusing, and I would even say concerning, if somebody were to ask the question, how many times can I do it and still be okay? It's almost like it, they want to get away with it. Exactly. It kind of reveals the heart that's postured wrongly, that that is looking to uh, reach the hand of the cookie jar just as close as they can get it, or the the flame on the stove, you know, just as close as they can get it. When I think you used the word radical early, yeah. earlier, like, no, it, to be converted, to be saved, to be in the family of God, having been brought out of the pit and having your foot set on the rock, and now you're following Christ, um, being dredged out as it were, Right. The last thing we should think of is, no, I want to go back to that pit and, and I want to see how many times I can go back in that pit and still be okay. Yes. It's, it's the it's the fire insurance version of Christianity, essentially. That is how a believer thinks. Yeah, you don't think, how close to the line can I get? Yeah. It's like, well, how far away can exactly. I get from that sin? How can I, as Hebrews says, lay aside the sin, uh, the in, every encumbrance yep. and the sin which so easily entangles us? Yep. Yep. That's the goal. I also thought of uh, 1 John 3, everyone who does sin also does lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. Mm. When it says everyone who does sin, that can be translated everyone who practices sin. The believer can't practice sin. Sin is something that's out of character. They can't live that way. Mm. I thought of a butterfly. Okay, if a butterfly wasn't flying and it was crawling around on a leaf, eating the leaf, you say, well, what is, what is it doing? Mm-hmm. It, it's not, it's a butterfly now. It's not a caterpillar. It's not, it, you're not doing what you're supposed to be. You're doing what you used to be. Um, same thing with a believer. That's the questions I'd have for for him or her. I'd say, well, you're, you're a new creation. Um, you're not to be living in sin. You're, you're not to be tolerating sin, practicing sin. That's not who you are anymore. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'll probably butcher the quote, but it's the old, uh, there's a C.S. Lewis line about those who have been saved. It, to go back to the same pits and, you know, temptations habitually as a mm. practice is like, like I think he says, like playing in, in mud pits in the slums when you have a holiday at the sea. Yeah, I've heard that. You know, so it's obviously picturing new life in Christ versus the old life. And why would we go back to the, the mud pits in the slums? Right. I think that's why we get so confused is because we don't truly understand what the mud pit is mm-hmm. and we don't truly understand what the holiday by the sea is. Right. And, and the more we understand those those that dichotomy, yeah. I think the more clear yeah. our assurance will be. Yeah. Amen. Um, Aaron, where does true assurance originate and, and how can understanding that source aid believers in their struggles with doubt? Yeah. No one, no person can give you assurance. Your friend can't give you assurance. Your parents, your siblings, uh, not even my pastor. You can't give me assurance. Assurance comes from God and it comes from the triune God. And to answer your question, I'd like to just focus on how each member of the Godhead Hmm. um, answers that and what scripture says. Uh, Jesus, number one, Jesus finished work on the cross is the foundation of our assurance. Romans 10, 9, we read it in the last episode. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's his promise. Jesus did these things for you so that you will be saved. Uh, 1 John 5, 13, the purpose of the letter, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So those who believe in Jesus and in his work, believe so that they may know they have eternal life. That gives them assurance. Um, number two, the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives is the seal of our assurance. Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you also, after listening to the word of, of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And I understand that seal to be um, what Paul was referring to was an identifying mark that was um, stamped or imprinted on a letter, a document, a contract that was the signal of authority um, signifying who was who was making that mark. The Holy Spirit is the believer's mark of God on that believer. It's his promise. Yeah. And number three, the father is the overseer of assurance. Romans 8.30 talks about how he initiated and, and sees salvation through. Yep. 
And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. He's not only the God of creation, he's the God of our salvation. He's the the initiator and the the perfecter. Yep, yep. And he is sure and he is good and he will see it through. Yeah, I'll continue on. I, I wanted to say um, a quote from John MacArthur that I really appreciated uh, about you know, your salvation, where does it come from? And and if you can, you know, how do you know it's secure? He said that if I could lose my salvation, I would. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's so true. If it were up to me, and if I was in charge of my salvation, I'd lose it. Praise God, I'm not in charge. Amen. Praise God, it comes from, from the triune God who made my salvation, who made it possible, and he's the one who keeps me. Yep. Like Jude 24, now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling. Um, and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Amen, indeed. I mean, you you asked me in our last episode, I mean, is is this concept of assurance one that promotes arrogance? Hmm. And we talked about that in the last episode. I don't think it can yeah. because of that doxology you just read from Jude. It, all praise goes to him. Mm-hmm. All glory goes to him. He's the originator of salvation. He's the author of salvation. He is the perfecter and the finisher of our salvation. He gets all the praise. Yeah. And the more we realize that, the more we dwell on that, we'll have less confidence in ourselves and more confidence in God yep. and what he's able to do. Amen. Amen. Well, Aaron, this was incredibly helpful uh, working through the enemies of assurance and how to take it back to what the scriptures reveal about the triune God and him being the fountain of all aspects of our assurance. So Good. hopefully this is really helpful to our, our listeners. I'm sure it will be. Um, I introed the podcast. Now, Aaron, before you close the podcast. I've done this before. All right. <laughs> take a deep breath. Um, we about five, six months ago now, switched to the Legacy Standard Bible as the the Bible, you know, I'm preaching from on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings and some of the other guys have as well. Um, so we're going to start from this moment forward wow. with this reading of God's inspired word in the Legacy Standard Bible translation. Aaron, take it away. Second Timothy 1.13. Would you close us? You bet. Here it is. All right. Second Timothy 1.13. Paul instructs Timothy, hold to the standard of sound words, which you have heard from me in the faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.